Well, hello there. Well, hello there. My name is John. Ma well, hello there. My name is John Meyer, and this is episode one in a new series where I take you along the process of writing a production music or a music library track. I challenged myself to only use real instruments played in front of a microphone, so no computer instruments, although I may have cheated once. I'm going to do my best to cover the why and the how of my composing and recording process. So if you have questions after this first episode, please let me know and I'll try to cover them in future videos. This week, we'll talk about the instrument that I started this track with, my trusty Froggy Bottom acoustic guitar. I'm a composer and a producer and a sample maker, and I write music mostly for production music libraries which means I write music for these giant libraries and clients come in and pick them for their commercials or television shows or movies. I absolutely love it and I've written a bunch of music and I'll admit that a lot of that music is written only in the computer and I don't have any problems with that. If that's the way you create using samples and all that, that's great. I sell sample instruments, so of course I am for it. Not by any stretch of the imagination am I a virtuoso at all of these instruments, but I found with every instrument that I add into the fold, I get better as a music creator because I learn things about each individual instrument that translates to the next instrument and makes me think about music in a much different way. I made a video talking about why I choose to learn instruments and I'll link to that somewhere and you can go watch it. This is gonna be divided into multiple videos. I recorded acoustic guitar, as you see here, piano, lap steel guitar, drums, bass. I did, however, cheat on violin. I used a virtual instrument, Woven Strings, which is a sample that I released a while back. That might actually change by the time I get around to recording it. You'll have to wait and see. The first instrument that I recorded on this track was indeed my Froggy Bottom acoustic guitar. I bought this with an insurance hail damage check about 20 years ago. I drove around with a car that looked like a golf ball, but all that was worth it because this is an amazing guitar and I love it. But before we get to the process of me actually recording this, we have to take a step back and think about the entire theme of this track and the theme of the album that this was gonna go on. It's not on that album, but there is another collection of songs that have a very similar vibe and feel. In many production music libraries, the album is still king. So we create 12, 15, 20 tracks that fit a certain vibe. Most libraries still feature albums as a way to get clients the music that they want. This album is a little different. It's a way for me to scratch an itch and learn some of these instruments. I think I mentioned mandolin, lap steel. These are all instruments that I'm somewhat new to. And so I wanted to find a style of music that didn't require to me to be a virtuoso, which most production music tracks don't require that. But I could take all those instruments and use it as a way to learn. This album took me three or four times longer than normal because I had to learn to play these instruments along the way. It wasn't just something I could pull out of my back pocket and record. I'm going for that indie folk acoustic vibe, a down home relaxing quality to most of these. What helps me is not only to decide what instruments are gonna be on the track, it's to decide what instruments are not gonna be on the track or what recording styles I'm not going to use. You know, am I going to be having a real elaborate miking setup for the drums or am I gonna keep it simple? Uh, am I gonna put four mics on the acoustic guitar and make it real hype and polished? Or am I gonna use a dark ribbon Coles microphone to make things kind of mellow and uh, not as defined, which is what I ended up doing. That's enough of that, let's get to it. We're gonna jump back and forth between the old version of me that recorded this track and the version of me today. But let me just basically talk about how I got to this guitar part. As with most of the songs on this album, it started with me playing some kind of acoustic guitar track because that acoustic guitar has the rhythm, it could take up a lot of space. I will say that a lot of times when I record acoustic guitar tracks for the for my music, uh, I know that there's a good chance that I will either cut it or most likely I will re-record it. Because when you're playing by yourself, you're filling up all the space because you want to because space needs to be filled. But I found that there's often a what I just played right there might benefit from when the, when it's time for the when, really record the acoustic guitar. So I don't stress too much about the part, although I think it's a keeper on this one. This is tuned in D, A, D, F sharp, A, D. For the non-guitar players out there, that is not standard tuning. Standard tuning is E, A, D, G, B, E. But with this tuning, it allows for open strings. I have a D major triad right off the bat. 
and it makes it simple to play other chords. Since this is an F sharp on this fourth string, I can raise this up to a D, and so I have another. There I have a power chord, so D, A, D, D, A, D. What's nice about these open tunings is it's usually fairly easy to play your major in your minor triads, or at least versions of those triads. Typically, if I'm playing in the key of D, I'm gonna play D, E minor, F sharp minor, G, A, B minor, C sharp diminished, and then D. But in this case, with all these open strings, it makes for these unique voicings. This is my D major triad, then you have this, which instead of playing an E minor, I'm playing an E in the bass, but I've got an A, and then another D, and then a G, and then an A, and a D. So technically that is an E. I don't know. What got my F sharp? A. What I like about this are the options that I get and I don't have to play traditional dark E minor and F sharp minor and B minor chords. They still have a light quality to them. When I write a piece of music like this, sometimes I scribble down a chart, but most of the time I know that it's only gonna be me playing on it and I'm gonna knock it out in a day or two. So I can usually remember what I did. So it starts with a D for a bar. <laughs> And then G for a bar. Two, three, four. B minor, two, three, A, G. And that's basically it. It repeats, but that's the that's the A section. And the B section starts on an A. One, two, three, four. One, two, three. B minor. One, two, three, four. One, two, three. But this time I, I decided to do a, a bridge or a C section. And it starts on this, whatever this E in the bass is. Two, three, four, walking to F sharp. I never want to sacrifice quality when I'm recording, but I also have to work fast. And so I typically set up one mic or two mics. In most scenarios I will have a my Coles 4038, which is right here. And I understand this is a, an expensive mic. And not everybody loves this mic because it's dark. And But for this style of music, I thought it was a good fit. And so I'll set this on a stand and I'll have it in one input. And then I have over there, Jordan up by the window, is my U47 clone that I'll often have. But for this project, I simply set up this Coles in the room and I recorded everything through it. So my typical workflow is to set it right about this spot in the, in this, in the room. And the reason for that is because I can sit here and turn around and be ready to record. I have my headphones plugged in over here and I have access to everything within my reach. I typically have this red cable going into number two and that is coming up right, right here on the end of this mic, I have the Fet Head by Triton Audio, which is like a cloud lifter, which adds more gain. It also is nice because you're never supposed to have phantom power on your ribbon mics, but this actually requires phantom power. So as long as it's in between the microphone and the preamp, I'm in good shape and I'm not worried about blowing up my microphone. What I'll do is then sit down with my guitar. This is a little cumbersome as long as I turn the same way every time. I if I make a little noise. And I reach back and get my gain up where it needs to be and I've got to turn my phantom power on, which you don't have to see this, but I'm flipping on phantom power. I got a really nice sound while it's firing up, which I have never heard before. Still there. Just for fun, I'm gonna switch back over to channel one. I'll probably edit this out, but this happens, and it happens a lot. Unmute that on channel one and make sure my volume is down. And then I'll put on these headphones, which are different from my mixing headphones. I'll mention that in a future video. Closed back headphones because of the bleed. And if I have a click track open, I gotta make sure that I, uh, or a click track, click track running, 
I got to make sure that I don't have any bleed whatsoever. And that means I also have to turn down the volume on my other headphones. I'm also going to engage a low cut because I don't need those low frequencies below, you know, 100 hertz or so. You can see I set this microphone up here. I know where I want it to be on this plane. But when it comes to finding that sweet spot, instead of moving the mic around, I like to be in this chair because I can move myself around. Another thing, this is the worst sound ever. Do you hear that? It's horrible. You don't want it. So always find a way to get that out of the way. And I usually throw that around. And now I'll make sure that I have my volume up loud enough to where I can actually hear what I'm doing. And I'll simply play the part, and it's important to play the part that you're going to actually play in the track because mic position changes for something like this and something like this. So I am going to play. Obviously, I'm never going to mic it like this, and I'm never going to mic it like this, but I want to hear it. I want to hear what happens when I get it close to the sound hole and be overly booming. And I want to hear what it sounds like to be way too thin and distant. And then I want to, I'm going to position myself in such a way that I'm hitting that sweet spot. I want enough low end and body. But I also know this. I also know that I can scoop some of that out if necessary. And I'm not hitting a compressor or anything like that going to tape. So I'm not terribly concerned if the low end is hitting the compressor before uh, the mid range or the high end and causing things to be weird. So as long as I get a good natural sound, that's all I'm going for. And I play through all the chords. I am using medium gauge Diodario E A X S. What's that? No, that's not right. It's the coded strings from Diodario. I like medium gauge personally. I think it's recommended that I have light gauge on this guitar, but I, I think it sings a little better, especially in these uh, drop tuning. I try not to overthink this part, especially since they're, the acoustic guitar is going to play a pretty small role in the mix of this track. I'm not going to put four mics on it because it's not necessary. When a guitar is more featured, perhaps I could put two mics on it, a room mic, a distant mic. But for now, I, I think it's perfect the way it is. It's probably going to need some top end just because the the Coles lacks that. But I'm super thrilled. I always have a tuner. Probably my next investment is to buy 10 of these clip-on tuners because I use them on every instrument. Uh, I like these picks. Actually, the man behind the camera turned me on to... What's the name of these? Brain something? I don't remember. They have a grip to them. It's just really nice. Am I hitting the light anyway? Yeah, there you go. For these hard strumming tracks like this, I like a little bit of give, but normally I like a, a harder pick. The main point, I'm using my ears to make the adjustments and my body is moving to the microphone. That's it for the guitar. Next week I'll come back with most likely the drums and the bass. I'd love to get your thoughts on this video. This is different. You know, YouTube is tricky and I'm trying to get better at it, uh, making tighter videos, but I also enjoy the long form videos that show more of the process, you know, the, the boring stuff. Hopefully more than anything, it inspires you to pick up a guitar or another instrument and write something. Talk to you soon.